Figgle. I'm John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. With the recent news sweeping across Canada and the United States, we will take a look in this episode at the Indian residential school systems of Canada and the United States. My guest for the program is Keith Burrick. Keith is an author and a retired professor of history from Canisius College here in Buffalo, New York. He'll be joining me later to talk about the residential school system, the Thomas Indian School here in Cattaraugus, and some of the long-term effects of this genocidal strategy carried out by the Canadian and U.S. governments. The remains of 215 children, some as young as three, buried for decades on the grounds of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Their deaths believed to be undocumented, graves unmarked. The indigenous community in British Columbia calls it an unthinkable discovery, and yet former students of the school tell us they've thought of nothing else for decades. It was one of the largest residential schools of its kind in Canada, but there were well over a hundred across the country. Many, like the one in Kamloops, was run by the Catholic Church and later by the federal government. According to Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Indigenous children were forced to attend the schools, separated from families, and many neglected and worse, physically and sexually abused. And many disappeared, their families never knowing what became of them. What they were told was that um, when children were missing, that they were told they ran away. And yet the community here knew that couldn't be true. Survivors and families of the missing children were sure a mass grave would be found, but they were unprepared for the loss of 215 souls. The government's own commission says thousands of children likely died of abuse or neglect in these schools. The legacy now is one of intergenerational trauma for many of Canada's indigenous communities. 215 bodies were discovered through the use of ground penetrating radar. It was initially described as a mass grave and then later modified to unmarked graves in an undocumented burial site. It sounds a bit like mincing words when you consider that these deaths were also undocumented from a school run by the Catholic Church with a history of documenting everything. Those initial reports were met with shock and disbelief by everyone except Native people. We knew that children disappeared in these schools, and by disappeared, we knew they died, and we knew those deaths were hidden. But we weren't the only ones who knew. The churches that ran them knew, and the governments that funded them knew. Now, don't for a second start to think this was just a Canada thing. It wasn't by a long shot. One of the most famous schools in the U.S. was the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. It was just one of over 350 other Indian residential or boarding schools spread across the U.S. Carlisle had a cemetery specifically for its children that died. Almost 200 were buried in marked graves, and there were likely many more that were unmarked. In a recent report done by a graduate of Dartmouth, there was clear evidence that Captain Richard Henry Pratt, who ran the school, sent as many terminally ill children home as he could to avoid having them die in his care an adjusted death toll would likely approach 500 from the Carlisle Indian School alone. For more than a century, Indian boarding schools or residential schools had a mission, and that was to kill the Indian and save the man. The prevailing belief of the white dominant culture was that the Indian problem had to be solved and that Native people needed to be civilized or eliminated. According to U.S. Senator James Harlan in 1865, If they refuse to merge into and become a part of the superior race, they must necessarily be destroyed. On the one hand, we have the Navajo as we find him in the desert. Here is the old medicine man with his two squaws and his children about him. The children, as we find them, before we bring them to the government schools. Few of these boys and girls have ever seen a white man. We bring them in, clean them up, 
and start them on their way to civilization. Kill the Indian was not just a metaphor. On the Canadian side alone, it is estimated that 6,000 children or more died in these schools or trying to leave them. Many would die because of disease in combination with malnutrition. Canadian press was reporting mortality rates approaching 50% by tuberculosis alone. Poor health care could make even minor injuries fatal. Accidents due to unsafe conditions caused injuries and deaths at alarming rates. Physical abuse from beatings and punishments are among the most troubling accounts from survivors. Sexual abuse was commonplace. There are stories of babies born out of rape from staff and clergy being burned or buried. Children froze to death or died of starvation trying to run away from these schools in desperate attempts to go home. It should be noted that calling these places schools is being very generous. They were prisons. The children weren't students, they were inmates. They spent more than half their days working in the fields or performing other menial but hard labor. Schooling was primarily Bible studies. There was little meaningful education at these schools. Native children weren't just prohibited from retaining any semblance of Native identity. They were taught to hate and despise their Native appearance, language, culture, and identity. There was no separation of church and state here. The government was paying churches for forced conversion and assimilation of children, stripping away any sense of being Native at all. Their hair was chopped off. Their names were changed. Their clothes and belongings were burned. Family contact was severed, and often children were sent far from their homes and communities and confined with children from completely different Native backgrounds to prevent communication and any cultural connections. Sterilization occurred at some of these schools. Young girls were routinely subject to pelvic examinations and were having procedures performed on them unwittingly and unwillingly. The children would be taught that they were inferior, defective, less than human, and that was why they were there and being treated this way. These were children then, but they would become our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents. Those who died were their siblings, cousins, and contemporaries. And death was not a failure of these schools. Make no mistake, deaths solved the white man's Indian problem, even better than assimilation did. Death was permanent. This process of deculturalization was actually denationalization, and it was designated a war crime by most of the world in the early 20th century, and later called genocide. A commission established in Canada to look at the residential schools determined that what had occurred at these schools was cultural genocide. But just like the rest of this process, this determination was a whitewash. This was not cultural genocide. That's not even a thing. The international community does not break down the idea of genocide into various types of genocide. Adding precursors to words like genocide does not add anything. To the contrary, it diminishes the atrocity of genocide by making it appear to be only a cultural imposition. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission refused to search for graves. This discovery of a mass grave or unmarked graves has come six years after Canada dissolved its Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The U.S. has not even begun to address the issue. This was indeed genocide, but not just because of the deaths. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group such as A. Killing members of the group. B. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D. Imposing measures to prevent births within the group. And E. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. This UN definition of genocide reads like the playbook for boarding schools. And in case you are like some who have a tendency to get hung up on words like intent, both the US and Canada could not have been clearer about their intent. 
This was about destroying the Indian problem by destroying the Indian. Both the U.S. and Canada announced their intent many times over during the hundred years of their residential schools. Many of the horror stories of these schools begin with children being ripped from their homes and families. And for far too many, this was exactly the case. But life in almost all Native communities was anything but idyllic. Government policies had created unbearable poverty and unsustainable conditions for life on Native lands. The reservation system was never intended to be sustainable. There is a saying that reservations were not a place for Native people to go to live, but rather a place for Native people to go to die. And that could not be more true than in the era leading up to and including the residential school period. First, it must be acknowledged that most reservations were like prison camps. It was literally illegal for Native people to leave without written permission. Native land either had already been chopped up and handed off to anyone looking for vast stretches of free Indian land or was in the process. Native people had been herded onto small barren lands as far from the white public as possible. Oftentimes the lands were confiscated from other Native peoples or simply was land no one wanted, especially with all the lush productive lands available that Native people had been removed from. The lands were agriculturally and economically unsustainable and work off the reservation was prohibited. Food rations and payments were promised, but were subject to any number of excuses for showing up late, diminished, or not at all. All aspects of Native culture had been disrupted. Ceremonies were outlawed. The people had been ripped from their original homelands. Their systems of government had been completely usurped by anyone looking for someone willing to sign the next treaty, lease, sale, or swindle. All the old ways were labeled as wrong, evil, or even satanic. Disease was a constant threat, and the lack of any medical services left Native people the most vulnerable to dying, not just from deadly disease, but even illnesses and ailments that were easily treated or prevented had they lived outside of a reservation. There was no work, no money, and no prospect for anything to change in the future. Families had become almost completely dysfunctional. If the parents of children were both alive, they were rarely in the same home. Poverty, Alcoholism, despair, and death was what life on reservations had become. The population of Native people on the continent was reaching its historic low. Reservations had truly become the places for Native people to die. So with this, some of the children were not ripped from homes, but rather dropped on the doorsteps of these residential schools by parents who could no longer take care of them. Babies were being put into these schools. Children would live their entire adolescence in these schools, sometimes never seeing their parents again, or only to find out that they had died or left the community years before they finished their time in these schools. The trauma of the abuse at these schools was often preceded by the trauma of the abuse and neglect at home. But the schools took any prospect of family or community connection away. Yes, there was physical abuse. Children were beaten for speaking their own language. The nuns, priests, and others who ran these schools were sadistic and cruel. Even though these children would work in the fields to produce crops for sale, they were very often malnourished. Children died in these schools at rates that compared to war zones. They were killed intentionally and by neglect. Many who survived were permanently disabled by disease, physical abuse, poor medical care, and the crushing psychological damage inflicted upon them. Boys and girls were sexually abused. Girls were impregnated. Some had their pregnancies terminated and then were sterilized. The babies of the unwanted and unintended pregnancies were never accounted for and assumed stillborn or killed. And the one pervasive scar that almost all carried with them was the destruction of family, both past and present. These children grew up unloved and didn't know how to love. They left these schools unprepared for any kind of life. 
They were destined to continue the cycle of poverty, alcoholism, and despair, and indeed did so. The trauma from these schools has stretched to generations with no actual lived experiences from these schools, but they suffer from something destroyed by these schools nonetheless. Mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, had the ability to nurture stripped away from them. We are only now beginning to understand the psychological damage inflicted in this attempt to kill the Indian, save the man. It's worth noting that while the schools are all shuttered, the last one closing in 1996, the churches that ran them and the governments that funded them and pushed for them are still here. My guest for the program is Keith Burrick. Keith is an author and a retired professor of history from Canisius College here in Buffalo, New York. I don't want to sound like a history professor, but since I am one, uh, uh, it's important to look at the boarding schools, how they started. You know, they go back to the early 1600s. Many people don't know that, but they started them in Virginia. Uh, Harvard uh, actually had a mission to uh, educate Indian children. Uh, William and Mary, Princeton, uh, and Dartmouth was another one. And then they had other kinds of uh, schools as well. That's where they started the half-day system, half-day of work, and and so on. Most of those failed largely because money ran out uh, during uh, after the revolution. Money from England ran out. But in the 19th century, in the 1800s, there was something called the Second Great Awakening around 1800, and it's they sent missions out to foreign countries, actually all over the world, but also foreign nations. They considered the Indians to be foreign nations, the reservations to be foreign nations. And uh, that's where they they started them. And right from the very beginning, the the whole idea was to civilize, Christianize uh, uh, the Indians and through largely education. So when we talk about uh, the, the boarding schools, uh, there's this long history, and it runs through throughout the 19th century, and then it became part of the, the federal boarding school system. So these schools were really designed to erase uh, Indians from American conscience and American consciousness uh, by changing their names, by having them speak English, by wearing a white man's clothes, by becoming the farmers and giving up the chase or the hunt, uh, teaching women how to be housewives. That was the whole idea, was to erase Indian culture uh, and force them to assimilate. Most presidents uh, said pretty much the same thing, because especially in the 19th century, they're all presented with this Indian problem out the West, especially at that point, and what to do with them, and and you don't want to fight them uh, anymore, but you can't you can't serve, uh, you can't save them. So you either have to try to assimilate them, Christianize them, uh, Americanize them by that point, or else exterminate them. That became. Uh, kind of the the mantra of uh, presidents and newspaper editors and uh, uh, politicians and everybody in the United States pretty much gave up on the Indians and figured, well, they'll just fade away and uh, go and and sooner or later we won't even remember them. The schools became a way of trying to assimilate the Indians. If they can't be assimilated, then they're going to have to be exterminated. Americans faced a real problem on what to do with Indians, and most people really just wanted to exterminate them. Uh, Some thought that they could possibly save them, uh, but, uh, you know, through the schools and and through missions and so on. But it was a real problem for Americans to try to figure out what to do with Indians. By the end of the 19th century, I mean, the whole Americans had just given up. Uh, There was nothing they could do. Um, I, I can't remember the quote by uh, President Garfield, but basically they, they they would just be remembered as some kind of a dream almost once they vanished. Uh, that was basically what they were thinking. <laughs> 
there's plenty of evidence that I know that the, you know the argument of whether whether there was genocide con, uh, uh, committed or not. There's plenty of evidence that there was every intention of exterminating Indians, despite the boarding schools, despite uh, the reservations. You know, the reservations they 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 sort of became a way of trying to save the Indian, uh, give them a place to live, but in reality, they became a place to die. Deaths continued uh, at the end of the 19th century, even as Indians were removed to the, the reservations. Uh, and and uh, it's, you know, they, you know, the Indians darn near became extinct by 1900. The idea that uh, somehow the Indians could be saved uh, on, on reservations was was. Un, un, undermined by the very policies that that put them there in the first place. If you look at the way the the wars that at, at the end of the after the Civil War, especially after the end of the 19th century, at the end of the 19th century, I mean, they were genocidal. They killed everything. Uh, they raided villages, killed dogs, horses. Uh, women, men, women, children, elderly, and uh, made it almost impossible for them to reproduce, uh, declining fertility rates. And then they locked them up on reservations from which they were not allowed to to leave. Uh, the law of 1851, the Indian Appropriation Act of 1850, made it illegal for Indians to leave in order to support themselves if they they chose to. Uh, they it was a, 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 in a way a genocidal policy that um, almost uh, led to the ext- this extinction uh, of, of Indians. But most of them were moved to uh, territories that were, you know, where, where their life wasn't uh, sustainable. Native culture was based, based on, and, you know, that, that's, I, I always hate people when they say native culture because that sort of homogenizes uh, Indians, but um, native cultures were based on their ecologies, where they lived. Uh, and so natives uh, from east of the Mississippi, when they got moved out west, uh, they were going to entirely foreign kinds of uh, environments. Uh, you know, east of the Mississippi, there are trees and lots of water and, and, and so on. You go to the Dakotas and you go to Kansas and Nebraska and places like that. Uh, the, the different different kinds of ecologies entirely. So they were placed on lands that basically, you know, we call them flyover lands now because nobody ever goes out to, to those those territories. Uh, they just fly over them. Uh, their their land was not really they, they couldn't sustain their traditional ways of life on the lands that they were removed to. Um, and and I think that was one of the biggest things that that happened to them in in the 19th century, especially when they were moved uh, west of the Mississippi. Their lands were were take uh, were uh, even if they were uh, placed on reservations where they had lived, uh, like the Lakota, for example, um, the, much of their land was taken away from them. Uh, they lost the ability to hunt uh, and and to pursue their traditional ways of of life. So the lands, I, I think, placing them, uh, placing natives on reservations and places that were isolated, uh, foreign to their their traditional cultures, uh, left them unable to really live, uh, to sustain themselves as they had in the past. Um, and that was really the reason for uh, the decline in population. Uh, in the, the reservations, that I said, did not become a place to live. They became a place to die. Uh, and a lot of Americans, a lot of presidents and others thought, boy, well, good riddance. You know, well, and, and, I, and I, would, I would also maintain that um, not, they weren't just a place to die because of um, – um, Looking at it in retrospect, I, I would say that they were placed to die um, as part of a strategy. I mean, if you could oh, remove, yeah. if you remove native people from, um, you know, from all of the, the the most valuable lands and just put them someplace that they could wither away, that satisfied the the native stra- or the the U.S. strategy. Yeah, and oh, that was that was definitely the case. Uh, there's no doubt that they, uh, the, you know, neglect was part of the strategy. Uh, just to uh, let them go there, and eventually they'll they'll vanish. And um, I, I think everybody, uh, most Americans, agree that that was going to be the case. Uh, 
you know, I, I have lots of quotes and I just gotten in, in, in the book that I'm writing about the Indian, as you, you describe the romanticized Indian, the Indian of uh, the, the long headdresses and riding across the plains. They were that was gone. Uh, and by the end of the 19th century and, you know, the ones that left that were left behind weren't really worth saving. In fact, I, I, there are some quotes that that in that book that I talked about the Miriam report where they said, you know, the 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 administrators of the reservations, the government agents, really didn't think that the Indians were worthy of saving. Uh, they weren't worthy of the medical care. They weren't really worthy of a decent education. They weren't really worthy of uh, 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 of uh, the food that they were they were supposed to be given. Um, and you know, in essence, that that was uh, like I said, good riddance. Uh, well, and and when you say worthy, I mean you, you can actually bring it down um, farther down to was that they weren't worth the expense. Right, they weren't worth the expense. But it really begins, and I, this is something I didn't mention, and we I guess we didn't touch on. They really didn't think that Indians were humans. I think that that's that gets down to the bottom of it. Uh, they were sort of a subspecies, and you know, at the beginning, when when the when the Puritans and our Pilgrim forefathers and all the rest of them were fighting, it was uh, and 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 defeating the Indians and driving them off their land. That was God's providence. God wanted it that way. The end of the by the end of the 19th century, they didn't need God's providence. They had Darwin. Yeah, this was an this was an evolutionary process, uh, a superior uh, civilization replacing an inferior one. Right, and and, and again, yeah. by you know, when you say God's providence, I mean that you can trace the language right back to to Genesis when it talks about subduing the creatures of the earth, and, right. and clearly native people were being regarded by the Europeans as creatures that required you know subjugation. Yeah, and it was going on all over the world at that time. By the way, you know they, it had been. It, you know they wiped out the Tasmanians uh, because they they were just simply in the way. Uh, the, the Southeast the, uh, South, uh, South Sea Islanders, uh, Africans, uh, they were doing this all over the world. And the Indians were just part of this longer. The, the, what was going on here was just part of this larger process. And uh, Darwin came along and explained it all for them, uh, and and made it acceptable. My name is Serapine Ness. I pay for the Western Indian School. I've been in school only three years, but I'm in the fourth grade now. I am a Pueblo and a graduate of the Albuquerque Indian School. I took my training in the Home Economics Department and I'm now employed in the Western Navajo Indian School. The schools destroyed Indian families. It separated the kids. They went back. The families were gone. Uh, parents had died. The children didn't even know it. Uh, one thing or another, but one of the most, one of the biggest uh, problems with the the schools was that they destroyed Indian families. And it left the kids when they went home all on their own uh, and um, without families to return to. And I think that that's something that we have uh, that has never been really brought out or isn't isn't uh, very well known about the boarding schools. One thing that we we haven't talked about is the the psychological effect that I, I wanted to get to earlier. There's no doubt that when Indians went, especially like this was true at the Thomas Indian School, when they, the, the children really felt uh, inferior, felt that there was something wrong with them. Uh, and what was wrong with them was, of course, they were Indians. And they left feeling inferior uh, and uh, unwanted. And um, it, it, it was a, because you know, they were treated so differently. Here they were isolated on the school, uh, having to dress in uniforms uh, and and re recognizing that they were somehow different. And in fact, 
The state of New York, which ran the Thomas Indian School, categorized the Indians with effect, defective and crippled Indian children. That was exactly their language. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, defective and crippled children. And so these kids learned that somehow there was something wrong with them. And they were going to be a failure no matter what they tried to do. Let me tell you a story. Uh, I didn't include this in my book on the Thomas Indian School because I didn't want to. The woman was still alive and I didn't want to embarrass her. She told me that the experience at the Thomas Indian School wasn't that bad. I mean, she didn't say it was necessarily great or anything, but it wasn't bad. And her family, the family that she came from, uh, had fallen apart. And it, there's a long story I won't go into, but all her brothers and sisters went to Thomas. And she read my book and she came up to me at the reunion a couple of years ago and said to me, you know, you, you, you explained that the school wouldn't allow us to have contact with our parents. And that was true. They tried to separate them from their parents, even though there was visiting days and, and all kinds of other ways of having contact between the parents and their children. The school discouraged it and made it almost impossible. And she said, now I know why my mother never came to see me. She was in her 70s probably then. And I thought to myself, here's this woman who has gone, has lived, you know, 50, 60 years after she left uh, Thomas India School, is still wondering and still bothered by the fact that her mother never came to visit her. That's the effect of the boarding school. I mean, I had people tell me that they didn't know how to love. Uh, women especially told me they didn't know how to love. One woman said that she couldn't tell her children uh, how to love, uh, that they, she loved them until uh, they were in their 40s. Her children were in their forties, and she—I—I I can't remember exactly the story, but she never could tell their the children they could uh, that she loved them. Uh, and I had people say, "Well, now I kind of know why we didn't hug each other uh, when we were growing up, um, because they were the families didn't—they didn't know how to raise families, uh, didn't know how to raise children, and uh, and then it was passed on to their children who." couldn't probably love either uh so yeah it's that 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 tearing children away from their families for whatever reason even if in some cases it was uh, necessary um uh really had a destructive effect on families and amounted to abuse in and of itself yeah yeah keith i'd like to ask you about what seemed to be a shift with the state's role and view of the thomas indian school for the first 20 years of operation under Asher and Laura Wright, they worked with the hope that if these children could be removed from the degrading conditions of the reservation and educated or even taught a few skills, then they could improve the conditions when they cycled through the schools and re-entered the community. But with no change in the policies that created the poverty and the poor quality of life, of course, this didn't work. Reading your book, I understand the state saw this failure and said they would no longer supervise the Thomas Indian School as a school, but rather as an asylum for disabled children. The Thomas Indian School would no longer be supervised by the state superintendent of public instruction, but rather the state board of charities. And that's when there was a distinct difference between native children being regarded as irredeemable rather than redeemable. Yeah, uh, there was a shift in the way they, they, they labeled them. Uh, they, they became inmates after after the state took over uh it was by the way the only state-run uh boarding school in the country it was really unique uh and the federal government had nothing to do with it uh it was the uh, the state that really did it and they treated them differently you're right than what asher and laura wright did uh who really dedicated their lives to to the children and to the school until it ran out of money, essentially, is what happened to it in, in, by 1875. Uh, but afterwards, they became, uh, as I said, lumped with crippled and defective uh, children. And um, it was really uh, a, a place for uh, children uh, to be sent when they were too poor or their families were broken or they were delinquents. 
or whatever might happen, uh, became much more of a place to uh, warehouse children rather than to really educate them. County and local welfare authorities got involved in referring children to uh, Thomas Indian School. Uh, the one in Erie County is, was sort of infamous, and a lot of people told me about her. Her name was Helen Wayne, uh, and she was kind of feared uh, because she would really refer children uh, from uh, Native families uh, to, to Thomas at the drop of a hat. Um, and... Um, uh, that's what happened with uh, by when the state took over. Local and county welfare authorities began to refer children, send children there uh, for one reason or another. So, yeah, it, it took on a different uh, connotation. Uh, the t state did build all the buildings uh, and really Im improve the, the sort of facilities at the school. But at the same time, the children really did become uh, inmates. Uh, and I think began to feel that there was something uh, that they were there because they were being punished. And why were they being punished? Because they were Indians. Uh, and and that's left them with this sense of inferiority, the idea that they were really not not uh, good for much of anything else. They were bound to be failures. The other part of it was that the school, unlike some of the federal schools, uh, like I was thinking of Choloco and, and uh, uh, some others, uh, that, that began to teach the children more modern kinds of skills, uh, mechanics and, and that kind of thing. Uh, Thomas Indian School emphasized agriculture, which just simply was not going to be possible. Uh, you know, agriculture is a pretty expensive business to get into. Uh, and you got to have land, you got to have capital. Uh, and the basic, the, the big, the, the only thing they could really be would be farmhands, which some of them really did work at when they got out. Uh, so the state really did not uh, help the children at all. 10,000 children died because of these schools. But some part of every one of the hundreds of thousands of children victimized by the state-sponsored genocide died in those schools as well. I want to thank Keith Burke for joining me and encourage you to read his book, The Thomas Indian School and the Irredeemable Children of New York. As always, if you like what you hear, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Let's Talk Native. You can follow us on Twitter at Let's Talk Native. You can also follow us on Instagram at Let's Talk Native TV, and you can join us on our Facebook group page. I am John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh. Love. My baba was raised in the era when they tried to save the man and kill the Indian. Fuck a residential credential, my pride on a million. I need me some cedars, some sweetgrass, some sage and tobacco. I need me some medicine. My spiritual guides never lie. Hold my loved ones in the sky. Let them in. We ain't agitators, we educators. We ain't protesters, we protectors. Dream chasers with dream catchers. We the wildest dreams of our ancestors. All my sisters and brothers are black, indigenous, and people of color. Let's hold it down and uplift one another. There's beauty and unity. Indigenous sovereignty. Black liberation, we go coast to coast Told me this the formation, this revolution will be live And they call it now For the next seven generations, all my relations More pain, more blood, more crime More sage, more life